Okay, let's go on because it, oh, it's already it's already it's already ten twenty seven. Okay, let's go to the next passage here. Okay, so the next passage we, we want to look at is actually we're going to go to um, we're going to go to very briefly to. So 2 Samuel 7, notice the title in ESV, Lord's Covenant with David, okay? Now, I'm not going to read everything, but just look through this as I scroll down. Do you see the word covenant in 2 Samuel 7, 1 to 19? Tell me if you see the word. Um, when the king lived in the house of the Lord, he had given him rest. Uh, Nathan tells the king to go do what all that is in your heart. That same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go tell my servant of David, would you build a house for me to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people from Israel. I've been going all over the place. And then he says, uh, thus says the Lord of the Lord of hosts. I took you from a pasture from following sheep to be prince. I've been with you wherever you went and cut off your enemies. Um, I will make your name great. I will point a place for my people, Israel and plant them. I will give you rest from all your enemies. When the days are fulfilled, you will lie down with your fathers. I will raise up for you offspring and establish your kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. My steadfast love will not depart from him. Your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever. Your throne will be established forever. What word is absent? <laughs> There's no covenant word. But clearly, this is this is a hundred percent. It's very clear. Yeah, there's no there's no covenant word there, but it's so clear, and and all of Scripture refers to it as David's covenant, the the covenant with David. It's it's all over Scripture. So this this is the the nail in the coffin for any denial that just because the word isn't present, the concept isn't there, because later Scripture will look back on here and a hundred percent say. Let's go to one example where it says explicitly the, the covenant with David. Let's go to Jeremiah. Um, Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with the day in the day and fixed the order upon the earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant. So clearly here, the covenant is referring to Jacob and referring to David explicitly. Okay. A hundred percent. I think there's Psalm 89 as well. Um, there's there's other references to to um, covenant of David. So you, that's not debated. There, there's a there's a covenant with David. Okay, so this really nails the coffin with the claim that if the concept if the word isn't there, the concept's not there. Clearly, the concept is here in in Second Samuel. the co The concept is there. So just to review, number one, Genesis six eighteen implies a covenant preceding. Number two. 2 Samuel 7, 1 to 17 doesn't have an explicit reference to covenant, yet it's speaking about covenant, okay? All right, so let's look at the text. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they faithlessly dealt with me. So let's just let's just break this out. There is parallelism going on here. So there is debate. Okay. So there is debate. And so I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like it's it's perfect 100 percent But let's just work through here very briefly. So you have a comparison here. This is a comparison. And then you have a this is the subject, the actors. This is um, if let's let's go to the larger context. Um, so if we if we can come well here, let's just do this here. So we can go over here to Hosea six. So everyone should be able to see Hosea six on my left. Probably you're right. So Israel and Judah are un unrepentant. Okay, so this is really the actors we can identify as. As Israel, they are, they have transgressed, and then the object is the covenant. So this is the action. 
coming down here. You have in verse eight, so let's just write this down here. So in Hosea six, uh, sorry, six, eight, we have a reference to Gilead. Okay, is a city. All right, and then up here, uh, prior to, we have a reference to Ephraim and Judah. So we have Ephraim and Judah. So these are places. Okay, and th that you'll see the significance in a moment here. Okay, so we have, like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. So, so here, this seems to be strongly implying this is referring to, to Adam's, Adam's breaking of God's covenant. And then there's a, there's a parallel idea here that's either being expanded upon or synonymous. And so again, you have, you have the actors are same actors coming here. The action is faithlessly. And the object is God. And then here's a place. Okay. Now... The, the challenge here is, are these two saying the same thing? Are they expanding? Now, people will say that, that because there's a location here, this location, should, Adam should be a location. There is a reference to Adam in Joshua 3.16. It's very obscure. It's, it's, it's not a place known of, of, of great importance in Israel. And so, so some people will say that they'll change this to at Adam. Okay. It is possible to see that the, 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 the grammar is very difficult. The preposition that would normally describe location is, is not there. So I really think that like is the best interpretation. So like Adam, as a person, they transgress the covenant. So just as Adam broke the covenant, Israel also breaks the covenant. And there is an emphasis on a place where they, where they broke the covenant. And whether you see in Israel as the breaking or a specific place, um, like Gilead or um, Ephraim, fair enough. But I don't think, I don't think it's appropriate to identify these two together. It's it's not a black and white issue for sure. Now, what's really interesting is in the Septuagint, which is a non-inspired translation in the in the Septuagint, we call that the LXX. This is the Greek translation of the Bible before the coming of Christ. They translate it man. So the Septuagint translates like Adam as like man, really, really powerful. They understood after the writing of scripture, after the writing of the Old Testament, that this reference was not to a place, Adam the place, but they saw it as a reference to man. So I would say this is probably the, the strongest confirmation that we should really accept this as a person, okay? It is debated, all right? It is debated, fair enough, but I, but I think we're going to go to another passage. I think it's 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 even stronger. Um, the importance for us here, it's just so everyone's clear, if this is the case, there is a covenant with Adam. That's the big takeaway, okay? If this is true, this is a covenant. The other thing that I want to note on is when we talk about, when we discuss the the Mosaic law, people will often say this is just external shadow type that's 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 one interpretation okay one possible interpretation all right uh that is partially correct but notice this here okay i desire this is god speaking i desire steadfast love not external this is external this is internal this is eternal, right? Steadfast love is eternal, okay? This is the love that God gives for Israel. Uh, 
knowledge of God. <laughs> knowledge of God. Internal. Knowing God. Rather than burnt offerings. External. So to, so to only see the Mosaic law, the old covenant as purely external shadow and type, just that points to the reality is deficient. Does everyone see that? There is an internal, eternal component here, and you see it explicitly. And so the question is, if this is only in its fullest, just a shadow and a type pointing to the to substance, did Israel, those that truly believed, did they not have the substance? Was God only externally a God to them? Was it only a, a physical, temporal relationship? And, and we, we, have to, we have to adamantly say, no, there's this internal, eternal component. And so I, did, I do want to draw our attention to that because that is so important. Again, it's just an aside that maybe you just need to put that at the, in, in the back of your mind for then when we come to the Old Covenant, we're looking at relationship between Old and New Covenant. And then comprehensively in the covenant of grace. So, so important for us to consider. Next passage we want to look at. So this is also another explicit passage that, that, um, that describes a, the covenant of, of creation, the covenant of works. This is incredibly important, brothers and sisters, because if this covenant is still in place, then when you preach the gospel, so this is, we're, we're going to just briefly discuss on, of, let's think about this evangelistically. We have, theologically, we're going to look at this briefly. We can look at this, we can look at this theolo uh, theologically, uh, evangelistically. We can also look at this biblical theologically. And I'll share what I mean by that in a moment. And then also practically. What are the implications for this? Now, obviously, evangelistic is connected with practical. So there's a close relationship here. But look at this here now. So this is Isaiah 24, um, larger context. This is the this is a, a coming eschatological. So when I say eschatological, I'm just saying end time, end time judgment. Es eschatology eschatological just means end times okay last times Eschato eschatos means last time so end time judgment all right so so look at this so then i would you should read this in broader context on your own the earth shall utterly empty and uh the earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plundered for the lord has spoken this word the earth mourns and withers the world languishes and withers the highest people of the earth languish. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants. They have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth and its inhabitants suffer guilt. Now, let's just go, let's just go here to Isaiah 24 in verse 5. Let me just check one thing here. I want to see something here very quickly. So let's go to Isaiah 24, 5. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, okay. So, okay. So let's look here for a second here. All right. So let's just work through this. All right. So number one, we have, we've looked at this before. We're going to go, go a little bit more detail. The earth, the earth is the object. The action is that of defilement to become this defiled means to be unclean dirty all right the earth lies defiled dirty when did the earth first become dirty or unclean correct ever since man sinned he's been polluting the earth okay and then look at this here who is the who is the actual actor that's causing this defilement the actor is actually the inhabitants of the earth. So not only has man corrupted the earth with his sin, he's brought about the curse. So this is now, this is now earth dwellers. Earth dwellers, or we could say humanity. Go look for this terminology in Revelation. 
it's all over there. <laughs> check out, check out inhabitants of the earth in Revelation. And that's you can you begin to see the correlation between those in the church, those in the, those those saints and earth dwellers. This is probably the this is probably the root place from where from where it comes from. Inhabitants of the earth, they're the ones who have corrupted it. Okay. And look at this here. We have a a reason. There's a reason. Why have why is this corrupted? They so this is the action. They've transgressed the laws. They violated the statutes. They've broken the everlasting covenant. So strong, so malakas, so brung lakas, right? So brung lakas. Now notice this. This is this is plural. This is plural. This is a time reference. Okay. So this cannot be referring to the Mosaic law because the inhabitants are not Israel. These, this here is Gentiles. What, what I would say, it's Gentiles and Jews. It's all of them, all of those that are not believers. Okay. So that's the first point. The second point is that there, this, is, this is a plural. This is this is plural. So this is more than one law, more than one statute. So even going back to Genesis and just looking at one commandment, although there's an accent on the one commandment for not eating of the of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, to only say there's one command without punishment or judgment behind it is to miss the point. So what I'm trying to get at, brothers and sisters, is we're going to look look in Genesis, but there's more than one command in Genesis one and two, and so. Obviously, Adam broke the law of eating of the fruit, but if he had not properly obeyed the command to have to have offspring, if he had not obeyed the command to subdue and rule the earth, those are also laws that were broken. So we're going to see multiple mandates that here now they're saying, God is saying, you've been breaking all of my laws within this everlasting covenant. So powerful. And so the only covenant, and this is much more than the Noahic covenant, because really the only institution in the Noahic covenant was you still had to multiply. There was the institution of, of capital punishment, and then there was the change in relationship with, with animals. But all of the marriage is not present. All of the the the, spe the specific other details is, is, is not present as well. And so People will say this goes back to the Noahic, but I, I, I disagree. I, I really think that there's a trajectory through the Noahic. So if you want to say Noahic and covenant of creation, fine. Okay. But it's much more than just the Noahic is what I'm trying to get. So that this ultimate origin, the ultimate origin is the, the covenant of works creation which is still binding. So they're breaking that. Okay. And then look at this here now. And this is why it's clear because there is no curse in the Noahic covenant, right? There's just, a, there's just the blessing and the promise that God won't judge again with water. Okay. But look here. Now you have a curse that devours the earth. Does everyone see that the inhabitants are suffering? They're suffering for their guilt. Guilt is the acknowledgement of breaking the law. So I say all this to say, this is a very strong passage that supports a, a covenant of creation, covenant of works, covenant with Adam. This is Adam and offspring. So that's why the Westminster Confession says the covenant, the covenant agreement was a covenant of works with Adam and his offspring. Okay. Any comments or questions? Is that is that is, is everyone tracking there with me? It's so malakas, right? So brung lakas. It's there. So if we acknowledge later on, so what's happening here is just big picture here. You have Genesis one and two describing this is time, and then prophets looking back. 
Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? So this is time zero, time, this is um, time, uh, whatever, eternity. Okay, and so the prophets, and this is really scripture, scripture is looking back using Genesis 1 and 2 as a foundation to then, to then teach about the future. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? And the foundation is a covenant of works with Adam. Has to be. Has to be. There's, it doesn't make any other sense. You have the curse. You have this reference to everlasting covenant, the breaking of laws, and all of the earth. I think those, so this, is, this would be um, in no specific order, one, two, three, four. At least four proofs. So malakas. And then within here, there's probably uh, A, B, C. Any questions or comments before let's, we're going to take a break now, but before we get into Genesis one and two, any questions or comments? Yeah, sir. I just want to uh, ask the, the few uh, remaining words in the verse six, few and few men are left. What, what's all about, sir? Who are the few men are left? I actually didn't look at that past. I didn't actually study this. So I'm going to shoot from my hip. Okay. I'm shooting from my hip. Like a shooting from your hip is like, it's, I might miss the target. <laughs> I can't aim. You know, I don't have the time to aim. So I'm, I'm shooting from the hip. It might, it might miss the target. Okay. So don't hold me to this. I, I'm, I'm really making, uh, what I would say is that within Isaiah, there's near and far fulfillment. Okay. So this is so my goodness. So, so this is Isaiah here. And he's prophesying to the future. There's a, if you can imagine mountaintops, there's a near and a far fulfillment. Okay. So probably in this, because, because the, the, the judgment of exile and radical change in history in Isaiah's day is going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. Okay. Jerusalem and Israel is going to be white. They're, they're going to be decimated. Okay. Babylon, the Chaldeans, then later on the Greeks. Are going to come through. So what I, what I'm trying to say is this prophecy deals with both near and far fulfillment. Okay, so I would say that probably this here is more on the near accenting. So there's going to be massive decimation, and the reality is that there's going to be few men who remain. So I would say that this here is again shooting from my hip okay shooting from my hip i would say this is the remnant and we see that paul will talk about remnant in oh. romans 9 to 11 yeah, there's yeah. also yeah. remnant in revelation um in jeremiah the, also jeremiah. yeah okay there you go D does that make sense uh are there not the elect ones sir? yes yeah, so remnant, the elect remnant one? is elect yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. So oh thank so you, also, sir, thank you. Yeah, so also Matthew, Matthew 23 and 24, right? So one is taken, one remains. And so that's really in judgment. That's really in judgment. So there's this cataclysmic judgments coming that and there's gonna be lots of death and few are going to remain. But but yeah, so we could say remnant elect yeah, again. Be, this yeah, yeah, because the context of this the context of this uh chapter is about judgment, yeah, 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 I'm correct. Yeah, it's it's it's, uh, yeah, it's more it's, judgment. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. Great question, Jesus. Great question. Okay, think about evangelistic, right? Uh, sorry, we I didn't even talk. I didn't even talk about this. Yeah. So we talked about the theological. We got the theological, and uh, the biblical theological. Let's just briefly evangelistic. This this tells us right here. Every one of us are doing this. So this is still pointing to the future. Every one of us are bound by this covenant. And all of us have broken it. And so this is the basis to then preach the gospel to say you have broken God's laws and, and statutes. And so what specifically, uh, for everything else, what specifically? We would say Ten Commandments, love God love others and use this as a segue to then preach the law to them to say look you broke the law you are under this curse you need to repent 
and put your faith and trust that this gives us the basis to then preach the good news to those around us okay and it's not a situation of oh i don't agree with you i'm just neutral here it's not neutral there is no neutrality you, you are you are look at this the the earth is defiled under its inhabitants we are it's are you are you an inhabitant of the earth yes okay you are defiling the earth with your sin so yeah and then and then this can go into uh farming practices that are unethical treatment of animals everyone's guilty of mistreatment of animals sexual sins economic sins family sins social sins oh my goodness I, we could just go on and on and on and so this is this is a great up this is a this would be a great text from the old testament to preach the gospel preach the gospel so of course this is the emphasis on the law and then the gospel is is the solution to this okay let's take